Part 1 Chapter 1 By way of an introduction, some biographical data on the worthy Stepan Trevimovich Verkovinsky. In approaching the recent very strange events that occurred in our hitherto rather unremarkable town, I feel that I must start further back by supplying some facts about the life of the gifted and well-respected Stepan Trevimovich Verkovinsky. This may serve as an introduction to the story to come. Let me begin by saying that Stepan Verkovinsky had always cut a rather special figure among us, in the civic sense, that is. He passionately loved his role, so much so, in fact, that I don't think he could have lived without it. But don't think that I mean to compare him with an actor. God forbid. I respect him too much for that. It may have been largely a matter of habit, or rather a constant and even praiseworthy tendency ever since his childhood, to slip into a pleasant daydream about his taking a gallant civic stand. Thus, he greatly relished his idea of himself as a persecuted man. In fact, an exile. There is about these two words a certain traditional glamour that seduced him once and for all. As the years went by, by exalting this glamour, he placed himself in his own estimation on a pedestal that greatly gratified his vanity. In an 18th century English satire, Gulliver, returning from the land of the Lilliputians, where the people were only a few inches tall, had become so used to thinking of himself as a giant that back in London, he kept shouting at carriages and people in the street to get out of his way so that he wouldn't crush them. They laughed at him and, and insulted him, and rude coachmen even lashed at him with their whips, but were they justified? What may not be done through habit? And it was habit that made Stepan Verkovinsky act as he did. And, after all, his behavior was milder and less offensive, for he was really a very nice man. Although in the end he was completely forgotten, I think it should be said that he had had a certain reputation. There's no doubt that at one point, a very brief moment to be sure, his name was mentioned almost in the same breath as those of Chidayev, Bolinsky, Grinovsky, and Herzen. But Stepan Verkovinsky's active engagement ended almost as soon as it began because of what he described as, quote, a whirl of events, end of quote. In fact, though, it turned out that there never had been any, quote, whirl, end of quote, or even any, quote, events, end of quote, to speak of. Only recently I learned for certain that Mr. Verkovinsky's reason for living in our province was not that he had been exiled from Petersburg and Moscow, nor was he ever under police surveillance as we had been led to believe. Such, then, is the power of auto-suggestion. Throughout his life, he himself sincerely believed that in certain government quarters they were very apprehensive of him, that his every step was watched, and that each of the three successive governors we had during 20 years had, on assuming his post, been warned about him by very highly placed, powerful people, and consequently was full of misgivings on taking over the province. And if one of us had ever tried to persuade Mr. Verkovinsky that he really had nothing to fear, he'd certainly have taken it as an insult. Yet at the same time, he was such an intelligent, gifted man, and his learning... Well, it's true that there were no special academic achievements to his credit. In fact, no achievements at all, I believe. But then, this is so often the case with our learned men in Russia... When he returned from abroad in the late 1840s, he shone briefly as a university lecturer. Actually, he only had time to deliver a few lectures on Arab culture, I believe. He also managed to defend a brilliant dissertation on the social and Hanseatic influence the little German town of Hanau might have had between 1413 and 1428, had it not been for certain special rather cloudy circumstances. That dissertation was a clever, telling dig at the Slavophiles of the time and made him many enemies among them. 
Later, after he lost his position at the university, he succeeded in having published just to show them whom they lost. In some progressive monthly that often carried translations from Dickens and advocated the theories of George Sand, the beginning of some very profound study of, I believe, the underlying reasons for the extraordinarily high moral standards of some knights or other during a particular historical period or something of that sort. In any case, he developed in it some subtle ideas of unbelievably high moral caliber. It was rumored later that continuation of the study had been forbidden by the authorities and even that the progressive magazine had suffered unpleasant consequences for having carried the first part. Well, it's very possible. All sorts of things happened at that time. In this particular case, however, it is more probable that nothing like that happened, that the author was simply too lazy to complete his research. As to his lectures on Arab culture, they had to be discontinued because at one point someone, probably one of his reactionary enemies, wrote a letter to someone else informing him of certain matters. Whereupon someone asked him for certain explanations. I can't vouch for it, but I have heard that at that time they discovered in Petersburg a monstrous, subversive organization of about 13 members that had come close to blowing the regime sky high. It was said that they were about to start translating Fourier himself. As chance would have it, the Moscow authorities just then seized a verse play that Stepan Verkovinsky had written six years earlier in Berlin when he was still very young. The manuscript was being circulated from hand to hand and had already been read by two poetry lovers and one student. That manuscript is lying on my desk in front of me now. I received it about a year ago from the author himself, who had only shortly before that recopied it in his own hand. It bears his signature and is bound in sumptuous red morocco. I must say there's a lyrical quality about the play. Perhaps it even shows some signs of talent. It's a little strange, but that's the way they wrote in the 1830s. It would be difficult to tell you what it's all about, for to tell the truth, I can't make out a thing. It's some sort of allegory and lyrical dramatic form that somehow reminds one of the second part of Faust. The action opens with a female chorus, followed by a male chorus. Then there's a chorus of occult forces. And finally, a chorus of human souls who haven't lived yet, but would like to have a go at it. All these choruses sing something very obscure, mostly about a curse laid on someone or other. However, they handle the subject with delicate humor. Suddenly, the scene shifts and something called the Festival of Life takes place. Now everyone sings, including the insects. A tortoise arrives and says a few sacramental words in Latin, and if I remember correctly, even a mineral, an inanimate object beyond all doubt, bursts into song at one point. In general, the lot of them hardly ever stop singing. When they do talk, it is only to exchange some vague invective. And even in this, there's a hint of profound significance. Then the, sheens... <laughs> then the scene shifts again. It's a wild, rocky spot. And among the rocks, a civilized young man is out for a stroll. He keeps picking herbs and sucking them. When a fairy inquires why he is sucking them, he informs her that he feels an excess of life within him, that he's trying to forget himself and find forgetfulness in the juices of these herbs. But, he tells the fairy, his main wish is to rid himself of his brains, a wish that sounds quite superfluous. At this point, an incredibly handsome youth rides in on a black steed, followed by a huge crowd of people of all nationalities. The youth is deaf, and all the people are thirsting for it. Finally, in the closing scene, the Tower of Babel crops up. Some athletic-looking men are helping to complete its construction while singing a song of new hope. When they have completed the job, the Lord of something, Olympus, I believe, flees ignominiously, looking ridiculous. And mankind, having gained insight into things, takes over and immediately starts to live differently. <laughs>
Anyway, this was the play that they thought dangerous. Last year, I suggested to Mr. Verkovinsky that he have it published, for it is quite innocuous by our present standards. He spurned my suggestion with obvious displeasure. He didn't at all relish my calling his piece innocuous, and I think this accounts for his subsequent coolness toward me that lasted for two months. And what do you think happened at the very time I suggested that he have his play published here in Russia? It was printed abroad in a revolutionary anthology without his knowledge. Terribly scared, he scurried over to see the governor and wrote a noble letter of self-justification to Petersburg. He read it aloud to me twice, but never sent it off because he didn't know to whom to address it. He worried about it for a whole month. I'm certain, however that in the secret recesses of his heart he was immensely flattered. He went to bed every night with a copy of the anthology that had been smuggled into him, and during the day he kept it under his mattress. He didn't even allow the maid to make his bed during all that time, and although he daily expected to receive a telegram from somewhere, he maintained a haughty, resolute expression. No telegram arrived. Eventually he forgave me too, which shows how kind he is and how unable to bear a grudge. Of course, I'm not trying to say that he didn't suffer for his convictions at all, but I'm convinced that he could have gone on lecturing about his Arabs if he had only provided the necessary explanations. Instead, he let himself be carried away by his imagination and convinced himself that his academic career was shattered by a, quote, whirl of events, end of quote. But... If you wish to know the real truth, the actual cause of the break in his career was a renewed offer made in the most delicate terms by Varvara Petrovna Stavrogin, the wife of Lieutenant General Stavrogin, and an extremely wealthy lady. She, su she suggested he take upon himself, in the capacity of educational supervisor and friend, the education and intellectual development of her only son, for which she offered him, it goes without saying, fabulous remuneration. The offer had first been made when he was still in Berlin, after his first wife died. She was a native of our province, a frivolous girl whom he had married while still very young and impulsive. I believe he had a miserable time with that, it must be said, rather charming woman, partly because of financial restrictions and partly because of certain difficulties of a delicate nature. She died in Paris, having been separated from him during the last three years of her life, leaving him a five-year-old son, quote, the fruit of our first still unclouded happiness, end of quote, as Mr. Verkovinsky once sadly put it in my presence. The fruit of their happiness was immediately packed off to Russia and his education entrusted to some distant relative residing in a remote backwater. That first time, Mr. Verkovinsky declined Mrs. Stavrogin's offer. Less than a year after his wife's death, for no particular reason, he married an uncommunicative Berlin girl. However, this remarriage was not his only reason for declining the position of young Stavrogin's tutor. He was fascinate, fascinated by the resounding fame of a certain professor and had his eye on an academic career for himself that he fancied would give him an opportunity to soar on eagle's wings. So, with his wings already singed, he recalled the offer that even before had made him hesitate. Then the sudden death of his second wife, less than a year after they were married, decided him definitely. Let me say candidly, it was all made possible by Mrs. Stavrogin's warm understanding and classical friendship, if that adjective may be applied to friendship. He threw himself into the arms of that friendship and nestled there for 20 years years. Now, although I say he threw himself into the arms of, let no one start imagining things. Those arms must be understood in a highly moral sense. The most subtle, delicate link united these two remarkable people once and for all. Stepan Verkovinsky also accepted the tutorship because the small estate he had inherited from his first wife was close to Skovoroshniki, the Stavrogin's magnificent estate near our town. Moreover, Mr. Verkovinsky felt that, in the quiet atmosphere of his study, 
undistracted by the immensity of the university load. He could devote himself to learned research and to enriching the treasure house of our national culture. No results of research actually materialized. What did materialize was the possibility of becoming, for the rest of his life, for over 20 years, the essence of reproach to his native land. As the poet put it, the essence of reproach you stand to your beloved native land, you liberal idealist. Of course, the person the poet had in mind may perhaps have been entitled to stand in a reproachful pose for the rest of his life, boring though that may be. But Stepan Verkovinsky really only imitated such people, and besides, as standing took, took too much out of him, he often curled up on his side for a little rest. Still, he managed to remain the essence of reproach even in a recumbent position. And that was good enough for our province. You should have seen him when he sat down to a card table in our club. His whole person seemed to say, Ah, cards. Imagine me sitting down to play cards with you. I know it's most unsuitable. But whose fault is it? Who shattered my career? Ah, oh, what is Russia coming to? And with an air of the utmost dignity, he'd play a heart. As a matter of fact, he was very fond of cards, which fondness, especially later on, caused frequent and unpleasant squabbles with Mrs. Stavrogin, particularly since he constantly lost. But more of that later. In the meantime, let me only say that he was a highly sensitive man, in some ways, that is, and so was often depressed. During their 20-year friendship, he had periods of what we called, quote, social grief, end of quote, two, three, or four times a year. Actually, they were simple fits of depression, but Mrs. Stavrogin liked to ascribe them to his suffering over social injustice. Later, in addition to his periods of social grief, he slipped into periods of champagne drinking. But with great tact, Mrs. Stavrogin tried to help him control this vulgar inclination. Yes, he needed a nurse of sorts, for he grew quite strange as time went by. Now and then, in the middle of a period of the most noble grief, he suddenly burst into laughter that was anything but refined. Occasionally, he even made humorous remarks about himself, and there was nothing Mrs. Stavrogin feared as much as a sense of humor. She was a woman classicist, a lady protector of the arts who acted only out of the loftiest considerations. The 20-year influence of this lady upon her poor friend was decisive, so a few words about her personality may be pertinent. <laughs> 